How's it going guys? It's Illuminostic and happy bicycle day. Um, this is the 80th birthday of LSD, uh, which was accidentally discovered by Dr. Albert Hoffman, actually synthesized for the first time in 1938, but then accidentally discovered in 1943. Um, so the actual birthday, 80th birthday of LSD would have been three years ago. My math is correct. No, 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 more five. Um, so my math was incorrect. Uh, but yeah, so 80 years since the accidental discovery of LSD. I'm sure all of you know the story, but just in case, uh, you know, he he handled it and got some on him. And uh, the story was that he got it on his hand. And there have been uh, myth debunking studies. Um, and they looked at whether or not LSD would soak in through your skin, and it was determined that it cannot. Um, so this is fodder for the conspiracy theorists that say that this story is not real, and that it was actually some kind of CIA program to create a mind control drug. Um, which, you know, is a bit ridiculous if you consider that LSD allows the user to, uh, what's going on Flesic, to really engineer their own consciousness, to rewrite their own programs. So certainly if you're kidnapped and tied to a chair and given electroshock therapy by the CIA, what's up, Misty? Um, as did happen to a bunch of people, MK Ultra is not a conspiracy theory. It's definitely something that happened. All of the documents are available uh, via um, the Freedom of Information Act. And there was some really crazy stuff that happened. Um, but uh, I don't, I don't want to get too divergent because uh, we're going to come back to this stuff in a minute. Um, so let's jump back to uh, Albert Hoffman's accidental discovery of um, LSD. So he spilled some on him, and uh, maybe he rubbed his eye or he got it in his mouth or something. And then he went back to the lab. He had a mild experience, um, but he knew what it was that he had come into contact with. So he went back to the lab, and he said, well, you know, nothing is active in the uh, microgram range. Uh, at least not to the extent that it's going to cause me any any harm. And so he ingested, I think it was 500 micrograms of pure LSD, which is a manageable dose if you have experience, but it was an awful lot uh, for someone that he had no idea what he was getting into. I've, I mean, I've wondered, you know, fantasized about like being Albert Hoffman, discovering LSD without any context, anything to compare it to. Uh, by the way, you guys, hit the like button, share, subscribe, support us on uh, Patreon. Um, you know, the algorithm does not support me, and I've had 30 less subscribers a month for three months now, which means I'm down 90, even though I'm getting closer to 10,000 subs. So I really do need your support uh, to keep the channel going. Um, it's all grassroots. YouTube's not doing anything for me. Um, so I do appreciate your support. Uh, so... Um, where were we in this tale? Uh, so yeah, the second time he got uh, some on him intentionally, and um, it was quite a large dose, and so he rode his bicycle home, and he described phantasmagoric phantasms um, and other very colorful language. It was a, an amazing description of um, the experience that he had riding home on that bicycle, and of course, as you can imagine, he was convinced that he was going to die. So he went home and laid down on the couch and he called a physician and the physician came over and said, you know, there's really nothing wrong with you except pupillary hemodriasis, which is uh, dilated pupils and a little bit of accelerated heart rate. And so Hoffman was a little bit relieved, uh, but still convinced he's going to die because in part, uh, lysergic acid um, alkaloids, uh, well, it's actually the fungus itself, excuse me, the the... If you were to eat ergot fungus without processing it, uh, the ergot poisoning is very similar to gangrene. Um, your limbs would rot off and you would go insane. Uh, there is a possibility that some... Um, it's very similar to mercury poisoning, which is actually interesting in a lot of ways. Um, but there was a town in France where it's believed it was ergot poisoning and um, everyone was losing their minds and people are developing sores. And whatnot, so it's extremely bad uh, if you don't take the proper um, protocol and actually extract the 
lysergic acid. And so the reason that Albert Hoffman was doing this is that he was looking for a way to uh, reduce bleeding during childbirth and surgery and uh, to treat migraine headaches. And uh, if you guys watch my channel, follow my channel a, a few months ago, I contracted Chagas or some other insect born illness that was giving me extremely bad headaches. And I was actually prescribed a ergot alkaloid uh, for those migraines. So it is still um, some of the er ergot um, sequence. Um, you know, there were the reason LSD is LSD 25 is because it was the 25th in a sequence. So some of these other. Um, alkaloids that were isolated are um, still in use. Uh, so uh, there were other benefits to Albert Hoffman's discovery. And so, um, of course, it was his problem child, which was the title of his book about this, because uh, once it escaped the lab, so to speak, uh, largely due to the influence of one Dr. Timothy Leary, uh, who was a, um, he was not a professor, but he worked in the psychology department at Harvard. And he had, uh, around the time of Hoffman's discovery of LSD, he had gone to Cuernavaca, Mexico, and um, ingested some psilocybin mushrooms um, at the uh, bequest of um, Gordon Wasson, who was the president, I think, of Sears and Roebuck. He was a banker, real straight guy. Um, and by the way, for those of you that have never actually looked at the whole story of uh, Sabrina, um, Maria, Sab Maria Sabina, and um, Dr. Wasson, or was he a doctor or whatever, w Wasson uh, and his wife, um, she gave them about 30 grams. Uh, so she gave them an extraordinarily high dose. And um, his response was to send uh, samples to Timothy Leary because he thought someone at Harvard should know about this. Um, you know, if you have this incredible psychological and spiritual experience, who are you going to send it to? But psychology department at Harvard. And so it just happened to be Timothy Leary um, that received this information. And so he took off to uh, Mexico to find the mushrooms. And when he got back from Mexico, I think it was only a few weeks later, um, Hoffman had sent uh LSD um, to Leary. And so, you know, all these coincidences are, are a little bit, you know, it makes a lot of people suspicious of the story. Um, I interpret it more along the lines of synchronicity and fate than uh, conspiracy, an evil conspiracy. Um, but, you know, it's just my opinion. Uh, so, let's see. Then, um, certainly not coincidentally, uh, Hoffman. I think it was Leary that sent him the mushrooms and said, hey, these things do almost the same thing as these things. <laughs> so why don't you try to figure it out? And Hoffman became the first person to extract uh, psilocybin as well uh, to isolate it and figure out what was going on there. Uh, also along these same lines, LSD was the first time that a chemical was discovered in the laboratory. Right on, man. Well, I'm glad. See, look at that, you guys. If you become a patron... Fish pondering is saying he spent the entire day watching the backlogs of the uh, patron stuff. So um, definitely sounds like it's it's worthwhile based on the feedback I'm getting to join the Patreon and to support my channel. Um, and you get to find out all kinds of amazing stuff about the you know lore of LSD. So uh, LSD was the first time that a chemical was synthesized in the laboratory and then discovered in nature. Because a short time after Hoffman's synthesis of LSD, uh, LAD, which is lysergic acid amide instead of lysergic acid diethylamide, so it's very, very similar structure, was discovered in Hawaiian baby Hawaiian woodrow seeds and certain morning glories. It was used by the Mayans um, uh, in a drink called Ololiki. Ololikiki? It's been a long time since I've seen that one. I think it's Olol Ololo. Ololo Kiki, Ololo Ki or Olo Kiki or Lolo Kiki, Ololo Kiki. <laughs> um, that was basically a um, well. Oftentimes it was a suppository, a, a rectal. What do you call an enema with honey? Uh, the the seeds pulverized um, and a type of mead 
and then also uh, cacao and um, psilocybin all together and enema uh, Mayan style. Uh, I've thought about having retreats where we um, try this, but I've decided that it's probably um, too weird. So we'll go ahead and skip that. I'll try it maybe privately and make a video about it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the first time that a chemical was synthesized in a laboratory and then discovered in nature. Also, it's worth noting that LSD in its original form was not actually synthetic. One of the criticisms of LSD is that it was made by man and therefore it's no good and everyone should just drink ayahuasca and uh, eat mushrooms and you should leave LSD alone, which is terrible advice because there are um, a number of applications uh, for which LSD is superior to DMT, psilocybin and every other known uh, psychedelic, which actually surprised me. Um, and we'll get to that in a second, but I want to finish out this thought. Um, so LSD is, oh, semi-synthetic, uh, meaning that, and I'm not a chemist, so this is an approximation of what is meant here, um, but it is the, the skeleton, the chemical skeleton already exists in the fungus, and the chemist just sort of fills it in. Um, that's the way it was explained to me by a chemist, so, um, you know, the best I can do. But it's semi-synthetic, and rather than being critical of LSD because it was uh, created by a human who is part of nature, in my opinion, right? We're not somehow separate from nature. Uh, I always felt that it was a beautiful indication that we're actually capable of working with nature to create something good, that the um, Promethean kind of consequences of, um, you know, fooling around with nature, uh, the atom bomb being a really great example of this, that that's not inevitable, that it is very possible that we can actually do good things um, with science and nature, and it doesn't necessarily condemn something just because man created it. Um, honestly, I feel like that attitude kind of comes from religion, and I don't like religion either. So, uh, so yeah, I, I feel in, eternally indebted to Dr. Hoffman for his discovery. Um, I think that the, d the discovery of LSD was one of the most important things that's ever happened. And I also think that it's um, really easy to underappreciate the impact that it's had. Uh, you know, the 1960s and the change in consciousness, a lot of people feel like the hippies kind of failed us. They all went back to sleep, became yuppies, got jobs, forgot what they were doing, and just sort of got sucked into the machine, and then their brains were eaten, um, and they just became yuppies. And uh, to some extent, that's certainly true, uh, but, you know, the... From the Grateful Dead to uh, Apple um, computers, uh, you know, I, I'm not a big fan of Bill Gates, but Bill Gates has said that, you know, taking LSD was one of the most important things that happened in his life. And whether he's good or bad, he's certainly having a major influence. Um, but, you know, I, I just, I can't imagine our world without LSD. And I think a lot of people underappreciate the impact that it had, how much it changed things. If you look at um, the 1950s and the culture uh, and then you look at like post LSD, look at post LSD pictures of the Beatles, right? They have this, um, really famous picture of the Beatles that's taken in the exact same place where they're all in the exact same positions, uh, pre LSD and post LSD. And that is a great approximation of what LSD did for, uh, culture, uh, and music and art and technology, um, and it, now that we do have the research, now that they've finally taken the red tape off to some extent and allowed people to actually research it, we understand why. And we have confirmed, speaking of the hippies, what they asserted back in the 60s. Uh, there is electrical activity in parts of the brain where there never is any otherwise. And I think that's a difficult thing for us to wrap our heads around, but we don't even know what's happening in those regions of the brain, right? And this is from brain scans that were done at Princeton. Um, we don't even know what's happening. And in my opinion, uh, you know, you hear a lot of stories from people that are, have taken psychedelics about increased uh, telepathy and precognition and all that sort of stuff. My bet is that those parts of the brain that we almost never use, where we see this electrical activity when people take psilocybin, LSD, and those were the only ones that are studied, but I would assume probably ayahuasca and DMT as well, probably even ketamine, um, that, that is the, um, those are the parts of the brain that regulate uh those lesser access capacities of consciousness 
that most of us are still not necessarily exist or convinced exist, right? That's that's my suspicion for what it's worth. Um, but aside from that electrical activity in parts of the brain where there never is any otherwise, uh, both in situ and in vitro, so in a Petri dish and in the human brain, uh, LSD has been observed to cause more neurogenesis than any of the other psychedelics, which means that... Um, New neural pathways are being created and even old brain cells that are damaged or withered are regenerating faster than psilocybin or ayahuasca or any of the rest of them. Um, and what that means in a practical sense is that uh, learning, memory, uh, and the repatterning of habits, so addictions um, and habitual behaviors and I would think subconscious behaviors uh, can be repatterned with LSD much more effectively than um, these other compounds. So, um, you know, I, th I think it's really important that we don't underappreciate LSD because it's not totally natural. Um, you know, it's in some ways, for some applications, it is the most important psychedelic that we have. Uh, one of the other reasons that I kind of prefer it for, or, or over, you know, even ayahuasca, um, even though, you know, that's basically my life is more or less devoted to ayahuasca. And by the way, uh, I have some um, consultations to do in regards to the retreat on Saturday. So if you are considering coming, it'd be a good idea to make your deposit because uh, the people, by the time we get to the consultation stage, uh, almost 100% of people end up booking. And so um, if those people get their deposits in, we only have six rooms. We may, uh, there's a, a cabin, so there may be seven. Um so there isn't a lot of room here. So if you're planning to come to one of the last two rounds, Saturday may be uh, your last chance. Um, it's not certain, but it's very likely uh, that we'll be full after Saturday, um, particularly for November. July is less likely to fill so fast. Uh, so, um, yeah, so one of the reasons that I, I prefer LSD as a tool is that without all of the physical... Um, difficulties that come with even psilocybin you know the body load uh oftentimes i don't really feel like doing much if i eat mushrooms um lsd doesn't really do that so if you're using it as a tool to accelerate learning and expand creativity uh it's really convenient that you don't have to vomit and go to the bathroom and all this stuff over and over again throughout the experience um you know you can walk around and it once you're kind of adjusted to it you can do anything that you normally do and in fact better and if you're skeptical of that statement, uh, just know that the research is in and sub totally supports it. Of course, there's a point of diminishing returns. So if you take way too much, uh, it's not the case anymore. But um, it's come out in the last 10 years or so that X Games athletes routinely take 100 micrograms of LSD prior to competitions and that it's considered cheating because it enhances their balance and reaction time and, um, you know, all of these different aspects of our, our cognition that come into play when you're doing something like that. Um, and that's all been studied and confirmed now that you actually are sharper and quicker and more balanced uh, when you're on a moderate dose of LSD. Um, you know, I always say to people that say like, you know, shouldn't you be able to do it without it? Um, it's like saying, shouldn't you be able to drive from Virginia to California in, you know, 20 hours without a car? Or shouldn't you be able to go to the moon without a space shuttle? Or shouldn't you be able to get online without a computer? It's technology. And the reality is that with the, you know, 100 times as much neurogenesis, the increased neuroplasticity, uh, all of the enhanced senses and electrical activity happening in parts of the brain where it normally doesn't happen, you can't compete with that. You will fail. Uh, all of the people that have pushed the envelope um, you know, to a degree that they have just left the rest of humanity a hundred years in the dust. Uh, they have all used psychedelics to do that. And, you know, at least at this point in human evolution, you're, you can't compete with that without psychedelics. You cannot do it. Um, you know, you may disagree with me, but show me the evidence. And this is something that Terrence McKenna used to say, prove it. Because we have the music, we have the literature, we have the geniuses, we have the technological advances. You know what I mean? Um, show me one case of, you know, people that are more advanced that don't use psychedelics. Uh, you will fail miserably. It just doesn't happen.
Yeah, and then so, you know, aside from the fact that you are basically an enhanced person uh, when you're using these things correctly and responsibly, and of course there's a skill set that you can acquire that makes you more adept at um, using them. We, in California, we called it building your acid muscles. Um, and so, you know, assuming that you have acquired this skill set along with it, um, aside from expanding your creativity and all of these other benefits, um, it, you can do tremendous things to uh, erase addictions. Uh, there was a study with uh, psilocybin um, where 85% of these subjects were able to quit with a single dose and were contacted five years later and 85% of them had were still in remission, I guess is how you would say it. So, uh, you know, you and, and again, you cannot compete with that with normal or standard uh, types of um, smoking cessation programs or addiction therapy. Again, the same number, 85% comes up that we're 85% more effective at treating addiction than uh, standard uh, uh, protocols. In fact, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous was originally going to be a 13th step program, and the 13th step was a large dose of LSD. This is actually uh, what caused the schism between the two founders and caused the, the one guy to bail on Alcoholics Anonymous because, um, you know, I mean, I've done this. I've gone in there and tried to tell them, if you guys really want to fix this, you know, uh, you could go to South America and drink ayahuasca or find it in the United States. And you get booed out of the room, which is extremely unfortunate because these guys sit around in there in AA and NA and they say, if you work it, it works. And you're like, well, how many times have you been through the program? 13. How many times have you been to prison? Nine. So what exactly is your definition of working? That's, I'm like, still a little bit having trouble catching up with that one. What are they talking about? Uh, and it's everyone in the room, almost, you know? Um, and the, the reality is that, you know, people that use psychedelics for addiction, uh, generally succeed. So it's really difficult for us to overcome the stigmas and the stereotypes. And there's something called anchoring bias where, uh, people believe whatever information they were given first. Uh, and so it's really, really difficult, particularly if someone has believed something for a long time. Um, it's a really difficult thing to convince them otherwise. Uh, but you know, one of the reasons that I jumped on here today to talk about this, because I actually have to get to ceremony, uh, in a few minutes. Um, but I just couldn't miss a bicycle day, uh, stream. I do it every year and it's just such an important subject. It's so important to, uh, overcome the stigmas and to realize that no researchers ever told the United States government, these compounds are dangerous. They are a threat to society and you need to outlaw them. That didn't happen. What happened is that the researchers said these compounds, this compound, particularly LSD, Humphrey Osmond uh, was one of the, the researchers that was involved in this. Uh, there's another guy you can find online. I can't recall his name off the top of my head um, that witnessed all this go down. Uh, but they, they told the government their report, their conclusions, you know, their, their summaries of their experiences or their experiments. Um, was, you know, something to the effect that every known psychological problem can be cured with psychedelics and oftentimes with a single dose. And incredibly, uh, the response from the federal government was to shut down the uh, research immediately. And why? You guys really need me to tell you? I don't think you do. But, you know, there are several industries that were threatened um, pretty severely uh, by the uh, advent of psychedelics. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I think it's also important to consider on this subject, what if all of the addiction and alcoholism and the violence and the depression and suicides, how much of it would have been averted if the U.S. government had actually considered the interests of the people over those of the corporations? Um, you know, I, if, if you believe the research and just imagine that, you know, a lot, a lot of the addictions and traumas and stuff are, um, hereditary 
or they're based on the behaviors of people that if they had had help might not have passed this damage on. So we're talking about an exponential reversal in uh, you know harm, societal harm caused by alcoholics, uh, depressives, uh, you know, that causes murder too. People go on rampages. Um, SSRIs have been determined to cause aggression now. And it's been known for a long time that almost every single mass shooter has been on SSRIs like Prozac or Zoloft or, or one of these. And now the, this major research paper was published, I think three or four months ago, um, where they basically said, you know, this was never helpful. SSRIs were never anything but a scam. And they may have caused or at least contributed to all of these mass shootings. So, you know, I, I don't think that anyone is in the dark about this at this point. Um, but the, the practice of putting the interests of corporations above the interests of the people uh, in the United States has well surpassed uh, criminal um, status. And again, you guys, just really think about how much pain and suffering and death would have been averted if the government had told the truth about psychedelics 60 years ago. It is just crippling to think about it. And, I mean, we do see a lot of progress being made uh, in the here and now. Um, but I think that people are still really hesitant to confront things uh, to their fullest extent and to really admit um, how far over the line things have gone. Um, and, of course, it doesn't just apply to psychedelics, uh, but it's, it's one of the best examples. Yeah, so happy Bicycle Day, you guys. Speaking of um, psychedelics, I have to go out and start a fire and prepare for um, ayahuasca ceremonies tonight. Um, but, you know, again, I just want to encourage everyone to um, speak up, speak out. Make sure that you know what you're talking about when you are, you know, spitting numbers. Um, make sure that your information is all accurate. Um, oh, you know, one more thing, though. I didn't mention uh, some of the myths and stereotypes. Um, LSD will not cause you to go insane unless you're already predisposed to mental illness, period, end of story. It doesn't matter how often you take it. Um, I'm not suggesting that people should just eat it all the time in reckless quantities, um, but you can actually consume quite a bit of it pretty often without any kind of psychological damage, um, and that's supported by research at this point. Um, it is nearly non-toxic. It's less toxic than vitamin C. Uh, the LD50 for a 185-pound man is um, about a gallon. Um, so, uh, and also when people say that you know they took so much LSD that they didn't come down for three days, um, it's not real. Uh, there are 10 cases where people um, thought that there was some other drug in a bag and they did up to 20,000 micrograms of pure crystal LSD into their nose, and they were back to baseline within 10 to 12 hours. And uh, all of them were checked up on five years later, and none of them had had a single flashback. There was no psychological damage at all whatsoever. They all considered it um, a transformational and extremely important point in their life. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm not saying that there can never be any negative consequences um, or that things can't go wrong. If you're predisposed... Uh, to schizophrenia, uh, it may bring it out. Um, there, there are definitely the, the possibility of harm is there, uh, but the reality is that um, it was so grossly exaggerated um, over the years, and there are still people sitting in prison for multiple decade sentences uh, that were not only not selling something harmful, but for the overwhelming majority of people, they were providing medicine that was desperately needed. Um, that has benefits not only to the individual, but to the entire uh, society and culture. Um, so, you know, the, the uh, prohibition of LSD is one of the greatest uh, travesties of modern history. And uh, all of us have a responsibility to ourselves and to each other.
to do everything we can um, to make that known. Um, so thank you guys so much for spending this time with me. Please hit the like button, share, subscribe, support us on Patreon. Um, send me an email if you want to come to the retreats uh, before it's too late. And I'll see you all again very soon.